We're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning. Uh, once again, I'm Mary Hall from University of Utah, and I have the honor of introducing the FCRC 2019 speakers. These uh, speakers were nominated by the FCRC conferences and selected for the cross-disciplinary impact of their work. Today's, uh, this week's plenary talks share a common theme that examine future applications that demand unpre unprecedented scaling of computation and data. And today's talk will examine how to preserve privacy in data analysis, analysis with a sol solution that relies on a mathematically rigorous foundation. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Cynthia Dwork, who is a Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science at Harvard and a distinguished scientist at Microsoft Research. She's a member of both the National Academy of Science and the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, and among other things, she is also an ACM fellow. So with that, I'll introduce Cynthia. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. I'm very grateful to the FCRC and Mary Hall in particular for this opportunity to speak. The topic is extremely timely, and there are many open questions um, and many directions for hopefully quick future work. So the topic is differential privacy and the US Census. I want to um, differentiate between two kinds of data analysis. Um, Statistical understanding of the population as a whole, so for example, as we do with census data, or analyzing loan data for evidence of systematic discrimination, as is done by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the brainchild of Elizabeth Warren, um, or maybe even uh, machine learning as we train a classifier to distinguish images of healthy brain cells from cancerous ones. And the other kind of analysis is basically finding a needle in a haystack, as in the Total Information Awareness Program, which was aimed at finding terrorists. So differential privacy is about the first kind of analysis. And it is the wrong tool for finding a needle in a haystack. If you want to find a noodle, needle in a haystack, you need to find uh, a different technique. OK. So, I want to start by pointing out that statistics feel private. A statistic is a quantity that's computed for, from a sample, and it tells us something about the population as a whole. So it feels private for a few reasons. For example, two different data sets collected independently from the same population and using the same you know, correct methodology should tell us essentially the same things. And so the sense of privacy is derived from this fact. Nobody knows, in some sense, whether I'm in the sample or not. Or if I'm in the sample, I can claim that I'd opted out. And after all, the same things would have been discovered whether I was there or not. And intuitively, a statistic is not about me. So we're going to stay with this kind of opt-out intuition throughout the talk. I could have opted out. You didn't know that I was really there. OK. So this intuition that statistics are sort of inherently privacy preserving is on the right track, but it needs some help. And you'll see why in a moment. So differential privacy provides this help. Differential privacy ensures statistical privacy for all computations. So we had that nice intuition of, well, I could have opted out. But in some settings, Nobody's allowed to opt out. For example, in a census, no one can opt out. It's supposed to be an enumeration of the entire population. And yet, differential privacy will preserve the I could have opted out privacy intuition or semantics for every computation, including total population counts. So 
As a theoretical computer scientist, I have to abstract the problem, and here's how we do it. Uh, Privacy-preserving data analysis, intuitively or abstractly, is we have a database on the one hand that has all kinds of juicy and important and useful and uh, uh, anxiety-provoking information in it, and we have a data analyst, and the data analyst interacts with the database through some sort of an algorithm. And the data analyst asks a question, that's Q1 in this picture, and gets an answer, A1. And then she asks another question, Q2, which might depend on the previous questions. It might be sort of follow-up, and gets an answer, A2. And the reason I say that I'm abstracting this is these questions, they might be very complex studies of a data set, but I can sort of think of that as a question that gets an answer. Or it may be asking for a whole slew of contingency tables, and you know a bunch of things come back, and that's an answer. And uh, people do studies, and they publish the results, and as a result of those studies, other analysts come to the same data and ask follow-up, you know, make follow-up studies, or delve more deeply into a certain area. And all of that is maintained by this abstraction. All of that is included in this abstraction. Okay. So um, this was uh, when I, um, um, inspired by conversations with the philosopher Helen Nissenbaum, and in collaboration with my then intern, Adam Smith, we held in mind the US Census as a, a driving scenario. And one of the reasons is that census has a legal mandate for privacy. And it's also kind of a nice thing. It's the analysis of the people's data to allocate the people's resources for the benefit of the people. And again, a legal mandate for privacy. And the users, the uses of census data are really important. Uh, allocation of representatives to the US House of Representatives, allocation of hundreds of billions of dollars in federal money, redistricting, and enforcing voting rights uh, legislation. Okay. All right. So here's going to be our running example, flossing. Um, let's go back to that intuition of just statistics, like it's not privacy preserving to, uh, to, to release statistics. And here's a counterexample. Suppose you are given the exact answers for the following two statistics. How many living physics Nobel laureates floss regularly, and how many male living physics Nobel laureates floss regularly? If you have the exact answers to both of these, even though each one is uh, uh, a question about a set of people and not about an individual, you would learn whether or not Donna Strickland flosses regularly. Now, this is called a differencing attack, and a differencing attack is just one example of how seemingly innocent queries, possibly about large sets of people, uh, can be combined to compromise privacy. And more generally, what has come to be known as the fundamental law of information recovery tells us that if you have overly accurate estimates of too many statistics, then you can completely destroy privacy. And the definition of overly accurate is tied to the definition of too many. So in other words, if you're going to ask um, many, many questions, you have to add a whole lot of noise to the answers or have a lot of distortion in the answers in order not to completely compromise privacy. If you ask fewer questions, then you need less noise in order to avoid compromising privacy. So this seminal result of Dinor and Nissim applies to any method of any kind of privacy protection that you might dream about. It has nothing to do with differential privacy. This is just plain the math. It's like what you can do with linear programming and other techniques. Okay. And it doesn't really care what the form is of these answers. So if I give you a collection, if I give you a blob, and you are allowed to query this blob and get answers, and you get overly accurate answers to too many statistics, then again, you will have completely 
uh, compromised the privacy of the data that I used for generating that blob. Okay, so this applies also to non-interactive systems where we might publish blobs or summary statistics or synthetic data sets. Again, if the synthetic data permit somebody to extract uh, overly accurate estimates of too many statistics about the original population, then privacy can be completely compromised. So that's what we're up against, this fundamental law of information recovery. And now I'll try to uh, explain to you the motivation and the meaning of differential privacy. So this is a picture of Cecilia Helena Payne Gapushkin, who was among the first women to obtain a PhD in astronomy. And she ascertained the temperatures of different classes of stars and estimated the great abundance of hydrogen in them, much more than Earth while doing research for her dissertation, which con contradicted the belief at the time that the sun and the earth had similar composition. So here's Payne in the, in the data set. How do we protect her privacy? What do we mean by protecting her privacy? So one intuition would be to say that the data analyst shouldn't be able to learn anything new about pain that she didn't know before interacting with the data set. And that's a very nice intuitive definition. It has echoes of semantic security from cryptography. And it was also the desideratum that was articulated by the statistician, statistician Tordelinius in 1977 when he was talking about a statistical database. And uh, the problem with this is, well, What's the point? So in particular, suppose I'm from Mars and I think that all humans have two left feet. And in particular, I think that pain has two left feet. And I interact with the data set and I learned that the vast majority of humans have one left foot and one right foot. So now I have a very different belief about pain. I think that she has one left foot and one right foot. And the question is, has her privacy been compromised? How do we define this? Do we define this as a privacy compromise or not? Now go back to that opt-in intuition that I mentioned earlier. We chose to define this as not to be a privacy compromise. And the justification is that ideally we would have learned the same things about pain even if she had opted out or maybe been replaced by another random member of the population. This is Henrietta Swan Levitt, the first to note a relation between certain variable stars' peak brightnesses and the period over which their brightness varied, which provided a valuable means for measuring distances across space. So this brings us to the English language definition of differential privacy, which says that the outcome of any analysis is essentially equally likely, and we'll talk about that, independent of whether any individual joins or refrains from joining the data set. So intuitively, we have these two worlds. In one world, the database contains pain, and in the other world, it doesn't. And the analyst who interacts with these two simply cannot tell which world she is in. And this will actually be true even if she knows everything else in the data set. So, an adversary knowing both data sets in their entirety will never be able to distinguish. And now we have to talk about what is the source of uncertainty when I said essentially equally likely. And our algorithms are going to flip coins. They're going to add some noise and that noise is going to be the source of our uncertainty. So if you're not used to thinking about similar probability distributions, here's a little help. Suppose you have two different coins. One of them is a fair coin. So with probability exactly a half, when you flip it, it comes up heads. Uh, it comes up heads. So that's 500 over 1,000. And the second coin is very slightly biased. Say, its probability of coming up heads is 501 over 1,000. And now, think about 
a coin flipping algorithm that flips exactly one of those coins and produces either heads or tails and tells you what it got. So the probability distribution on outcomes is nearly the same for the two coins. Your chance of seeing heads as an output of this coin flipping algorithm is almost the same. And in fact, based on just one coin flip or even a small number of coin flips, you can never determine which was the true coin with any, with any certainty. So that's the kind of uncertainty we're going to have. We're gonna have these two different databases and they're gonna differ in the population of just one person, in, in, in the data of just one person and the distribution on outputs will be very similar just like this. So just before I get much further, this is all this talk about, about privacy and this is going to be a very, very strong definition of privacy, but what about the data analysis part? I mean, I could give you great privacy by giving absolutely no information about the data set. So if, you've, if you know some machine learning, you'll see that the property that we're talking about is a stability property and stability is necessary and to some extent sufficient for learning. So stability is going to preserve Payne's privacy and prevent overfitting of the data. And it's going to ensure, I mean, it, 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 we, we have that instead of just this assumed conflict between accuracy and privacy, we actually see here that privacy and the ability to generalize beyond your sample are aligned. So this is the formal definition of differential privacy. Uh, my co-authors were Frank McSherry, Kobe Nissim, and Adam Smith. And um, I have to explain a few things. So first of all, privacy is not a binary thing in differential privacy. There's a parameter which is usually called epsilon, which is going to sort of control our degree of privacy loss. So you feed the parameter epsilon into the algorithms and it will ensure epsilon differential privacy. Now our algorithms are usually called M for mechanism and we need the concept of adjacent databases. But you've already heard about these. These are a pair of databases, X and Y, that differ in the data of just one person. So for example, Y may be a subset of X and X has the data of exactly one more person. So everybody here in this room versus everybody in this room without me. Those are adjacent data sets. So our algorithms will operate on databases and they'll produce some sort of output. And we can look at output events, S, some subset of, of possible outputs. And we say that our mechanism gives epsilon differential privacy if for every pair of adjacent data sets, X and Y, and every possible output event S, the probability that we observe S when the database is X is very close to, and we'll get to that in a second, the probability that we see the event S when the database is Y. So the probability is bounded, uh, on the left is bounded by E to the epsilon times the probability on the right. So, um, and because X and Y are completely symmetric in this definition, the reverse inequality also holds. Now, epsilon is going to be our bound on privacy loss. Um, uh, it's our measure of privacy loss. As you can see that if epsilon is zero, then e to the zero is just one and, and, and there's no change. Okay? And the probability spaces for our two probabilities here are over the coin flips of the algorithm. So it's worst case over all pairs of databases and the probabilities are the flips of the algorithm. Now, when epsilon is small, e to the epsilon is about one plus epsilon. So you might prefer to look at it this way if the e to the epsilon is bothering you. All right. Um, so, notice that this is a statement about the behavior of the algorithm M. It doesn't care who is observing the output, what that observer happens to know, how much computational power is available to that observer, it's now or in the future. So it's future-proof. And the definition says 
yes, you can learn about pain. You can learn that pain is very likely, very likely had one left foot and one right foot. But, what you, you, but you can only learn things that you couldn't learn without pain. Okay. So if the database Y is, is sort of the world without pain and the database X is the world with pain, you will learn essentially the same things, okay. and vice versa. Okay. So I said earlier that if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, differential privacy is the wrong tool. And indeed, it was designed to protect outliers. In some sense, the outliers need privacy protection much more than people who sort of fit in with the mainstream. So this is not an accident. And uh, you can see that if X is the haystack and Y is the haystack without the needle, then we get essentially the same behavior either way. Okay. Key properties, first of all, it's future-proof, as I mentioned. It's resilient to present and future information from other sources and any extra computation. And it composes gracefully and automatically. That is, we understand the cumulative privacy loss over multiple computations. It was this cumulative privacy loss that caused us trouble when we asked about the Nobel laureates that floss regularly. It was the fact that there was this follow-up question. So differential privacy sort of handles the, this, this issue, this cumulative loss. At worst, the privacy losses will add up. Um, more sophisticated analyses show that uh, they they can cancel out. Sometimes privacy loss is negative, and we can use that. But nothing that I'm going to say today will, will require that. As a result, differential privacy is programmable. That is, you can define small differentially private building blocks for different tasks, and you can combine them uh, in order to carry out a more sophisticated statistical differentially private analysis, and we understand the cumulative privacy loss. And since the epsilons are parameters, we can adjust them in order to control the cumulative privacy loss. So the sine qua non of a really good privacy uh, definition is this is composition, being able to understand composition. OK. All right. So I'm going to tell you about one technique. There are not going to be any proofs, but um, this is a very general and basic technique. So um, what I care about is how much the data of one person can affect the outcome of your computation. So suppose there's something you want to compute from your data set. Call it F. And, uh, and so if the database is x, what you want really to get your hands on is f of x, but you may not get exactly that. You may get something close to that in order to protect privacy. So this uh, quantity, delta 1, or this is called the sensitivity of the function x. And it's asking for the maximum, assume that f is real valued, it's asking for the maximum over any pair of adjacent databases. Those are databases that differ in the data of just one person of the absolute value, the difference between f of x and f of y. How much can the addition or deletion of one person swing the value of the function f? That's the sensitivity. So the theorem says, Suppose you have a function that takes databases, uh, should have been any size, uh, to real numbers. Then the following algorithm will ensure epsilon differential privacy. You compute f on your database x. You add a draw from the Laplace distribution that has this particular parameter, and I'll discuss that in a minute. Then you'll get epsilon differential privacy when you publish the sum. So let's look at this. Um, in the drawing, this parameter um, controls how, how peaked or how fat the distribution is. So a bigger parameter is a fatter distribution. It's spreading stuff out away from zero. So what this says is if you want to handle a function that really swings things widely, you have to have fat noise. 
and there's the sensitivity in the numerator, so it's right where it belongs. Now, if you want very good privacy, that corresponds to a very small epsilon. So again, you want to spread that out, and epsilon is in the denominator, again, where it belongs. So in particular, what this shows us is if you wanted to ask a single counting query and get a different, an epsilon differentially private answer, you would need to scale your noise to one over epsilon. And um, uh, if we think of epsilon as a constant, then what we get here is that for a single counting query, the noise should be scaled to what I should have written as one over epsilon, but since epsilon's a constant, it's scaled to one. Now, this theorem is nice because it extends immediately to um, vector-valued functions. So here, if you're mapping now your database to some point in k space, k-dimensional space, then you just need to add um, uh, uh, Laplace noise with, again, this same distribution, only now the sensitivity is the L1 norm of f of x minus f of y, so the sums in each of the k different components of how much they can differ. Um, so in particular, think about a histogram. So here I've taken space and I've partitioned it into a bunch of disjoint regions. The theorem says if you want to know and release in a differentially private way how many people are in each of these different regions of the space, it's enough to add noise that's scaled to one over epsilon to each one. And the reason is adding or deleting a single person can only change the count in one of the cells and that count by only one. So even though this is this big k-dimensional thing, um, the sensitivity is still one. Now, this actually captures contingency tables, and contingency tables are the workhorse of official statistics. So it turns out to be an extremely powerful tool. Now, in general, for k arbitrary counting queries, the sensitivity could be higher. So, for example, we might ask um, how many people in the room speak French, how many people in the room speak Italian, how many people in the room speak German. If there's one person who speaks all of those languages, then the sensitivity of that triple of queries together would be three, not one. And so the, uh, in, in, in the worst case, we would have to add noise on the order of K to each one. All right, so now that you have seen the definition of differential privacy, its motivation, and a, a flavor of one of the techniques that we use to achieve differential privacy, because there are many techniques, and we choose the right ones for the right scenarios, let's turn to the other part of this talk, which is, differential, which is the, the 2020 decennial census. So differential privacy is now widely used in industry, for example, by Google, Apple, Microsoft, Uber, and so on. But even within the most pr uh, privately protective of these firms, it's not used comprehensively. But it will be used comprehensively in the decennial census. So every decade the US government carries out a complete enumeration of people living in the US and as I noted earlier uh, these enumerated populations serve as the basis for apportionment of the congressional seats and hundreds of billions of dollars in federal money. Now the census even for the decennial census every 10 years uh, publishes 7.7 .7 billion statistics on 300.7 million people. And the census carried out a reconstruction and re-identification attack on the 2010 release and concluded that the techniques used in 2010 do not suffice. So this is John Abel, the chief scientist and associate director of research and methodology at the US Census Bureau, and he wrote that technical advances revealed a new vulnerability. So this starts with the sort of de Nisim results that I mentioned earlier and uses some other attacks called linkage attacks. 
um, in which data that has many fields but doesn't have a name are linked to publicly available data that overlap on some of those fields and do have names. So, uh, so John said this allowed people to reconstruct data from tables that were previously assumed to be privacy preserving. And here are some slides from Abaud's talk on this in February of this year, staring down the database reconstruction theorem. And he describes the attack and roughly speaking, they reconstructed putative individuals from the released summaries and statistics and tables in the 2010 census release. They linked putative people, which didn't have names, to acquire personally identifiable information using commercially available data sets. So the census also has access to these commercially available data sets, and so do privacy attackers. And then the census was in the unique position of being able to compare the putative re-identifications to ground truth in the confidential data, and they found that they were correct on 17% of their uh, putative re-identifications, or 52 million individuals. And when, in this particular case, because um, you'll see the form in a little bit, but the, the, the 2010 decennial, the decennial forms are very short. But nonetheless, despite being very short, there's a lot of attention paid to race and ethnicity and they end up being learned exactly, not statistically, for these re-identified individuals. Okay, so Abound says, we fixed this, this is his slide, for the 2020 census by implementing differential privacy. And how do you think this was greeted? Do you think it got jubilation? So, not so much. So, it's important to understand a little bit, and I'll, I'll have a few different slides on this. The complaints, some of them were of the following form. The old privacy protections worked well enough. Well, yeah, maybe, but the census did this reconstruction. Another complaint, the law doesn't care what you learn about people, only whether or not you can match a record to a name, which strikes me as somewhat cynical. Um, We've heard a lot about the privacy budget, but what about a utility budget? You know, and it's true. If you're going to infuse noise into things, you really do need to think about what the utility is. And thinking about privacy more generally vis-a-vis -vis the, the federal statistical agencies more broadly, a huge amount of money, billions of dollars, are spent collecting the data and putting it, um, and, and respondents spend a lot of time filling out these surveys, specifically in order that these data can help inform important choices and allocation decisions. And so what of all this effort? And what will happen when we start using differential privacy, or if we start using differential privacy, more broadly. Now, if you look at the census website, you see that trust is really considered to be essential. And there's a section on confidentiality. And, uh, uh, well, this, that every Census Bureau employee takes a lifetime oath to protect your personal identification. And there are fines and there's prison if they misbehave. So privacy protection is fundamental to trust, and trust is believed to be essential for carrying out an accurate census. And this is, of course, one of the problems with the citizenship question. It raises issues of trust and fear, and it will interfere probably with an accurate count. And so we have this sort of other inconvenient truth. Remember that the fundamental law that says that overly accurate estimates of too many statistics completely destroys privacy, describes limits on any methodology, and census has to provide a privacy guarantee. There is no alternative theory to differential privacy. And some of the bounds for certain kinds of problems uh, that, 
some of the upper bounds, like, like how well we can do with differential privacy, matches up with the fundamental law. So if you're going to avoid this sort of total privacy breakdown, you have to, you, you can't get more accurate than those algorithms do. Sort of by, by the fundamental law. It doesn't care that it's because it's from differential privacy, it's from the fundamental law. So this is the bind. So assuming that we're going forward with this, and census will be going forward with this as far as I know, here are some of the challenges moving forward. First of all, there's the allocation of the privacy resource. So I mentioned that differential privacy takes as input a privacy parameter epsilon. And I also said that we understand how privacy losses add up. So when you take those two ideas together, you could say, okay, we're going to choose a maximum allowable cumulative privacy loss. Let's call that the budget. And that will be our promised cap on privacy loss over all the questions and all of the releases that we do. And when we reach that amount of privacy loss, we're gonna just turn off access to the database. So assume then that we have a privacy budget. Well, how do we choose the budget? So Abe and Schmuta have ideas about, about the economic considerations that ought to be involved. Um, uh, but it's, of course, it's, it's, it's a political question and it's a policy question and it should be informed by economics and various other fields. But it's a, it's a problem. I mean, it has to happen. And then there's the question of who is going to choose the privacy budget. So in different scenarios, who is the right person or what kind of commission should be doing it and so on. Now, assume we have a privacy budget. There are many competing things that people want to learn from the data set. And somehow or other, these queries need to be prioritized and their accuracy, the, the needed accuracy needs to be considered in order to figure out how to allocate this privacy budget among the different queries. And until now, the Census Bureau hasn't had to concern itself too much with questions of exactly which questions are being asked and how should we allocate things because they made things public and then people did with them what they wanted to do with them. But now there's a sort of back and forth that has to happen and the Bureau is asking for information. What do you want to compute and why? So that they can, they can try to make these uh, allocations appropriately. On the other side, there's the point of view of the researchers. So who use these data besides um, sort of the, the official uses? What are their uses? Well, historians, sociologists, demographers, economists, and so on. And even if these people are used to using statistical packages and they're completely sort of proficient in that sort of thing, um, nobody, in, that, in those communities has been trained to interact with data in a differentially private way. So for example, when you talk to, if you, if you take a statistics course, the first thing it says about analyzing data is, look at the data. Well, you can't look at the data in differential privacy. You don't get to see raw data, because if you got to see raw data, then you, you know, what you are seeing wouldn't be the same if this particular row is or is not in the data set. So how do, you, how do you interact with the data set? How do you learn the kinds of things you would have learned or been looking for when you, quote, look at the data? Um, uh, sorry. Um, also, now you have to learn to adjust for noise. So for example, if the computation is one where Laplace noise had been added, uh, a trained statistician or someone trained in this, in this uh, art would be able to sort of reverse engineer the effects of the noise and, and in establishing confidence intervals. With previous techniques that the Bureau had used for maintaining privacy, 
nobody knew what that noise was or the noise generation mechanism or exactly what was so-called swap rate was and, and, and uh, it was difficult to account for the things that were being done with privacy and to, to ensure privacy and people who work with the data have become used to thinking of these previous things as capturing ground truth. They didn't capture ground truth. They never captured ground truth, but people aren't used to thinking in those terms. So now suddenly things are noisy, which is bad. On the other hand, we understand the noise and can counteract it, which should help. But in any case, people have to learn to do this. And a lot of things that we would like to know how to do, a lot of analyses that we would like to carry out and uh, some understanding of how can we clean data in a differentially private way, um, uh, we don't know how to do necessarily. And so there's a whole lot of research that needs to be carried out in order to, to come up with sort of really general libraries that will allow people to interact smoothly with their data sets. And I mentioned here, many times I've heard uh, statisticians, tell, you know, statisticians tell me all the action is in the outliers. I don't know what to make of that exactly, but I, as, I, as I said earlier, differential privacy protects the outliers. So if you're really looking for something that's, that's really just tightly focused at the outliers, these techniques don't work. On the other hand, sometimes they talk about, well, we need to investigate the tails, and there I'm a little bit more optimistic. Okay, now there are uh, two kinds of census uh, surveys. One is called the decennial census, and this is a picture of the 2010 decennial census, and we'll go over it in a second. The other is what's called the American Community Survey, and this is carried out on a random sample of I think 5%, but I'm not sure, of the population every year. And let's compare. So the decennial census is a very simple form, and in fact, the website said 10 questions, 10 minutes. So here are the kinds of, here are the questions. The number of people living in the home as of April 1st, 2010. The number of additional people who are um, staying in the home. Uh, the, is the home a house, an apartment, is it a mobile home? The phone number, uh, name, sex, and age of the, um, uh, of everybody living there. And for everybody living in the home, um, information about uh, whether they are of Hispanic or Latino origin. And uh, there are, I think, six racial categories listed and um, people are invited to check all that apply. And then the other question is, do people living there ever stay anywhere else? So for example, in a college dorm or in a military barracks or in jail. Okay. So that's what the short form or the, decen the, the decennial form looks like. The American Community Survey is much, much more detailed. It asks about housing, ancestry, the journey to work, computer and internet use, disability, employment, family and relationships to the householder, fertility, food stamps, grandparents as caregivers, health insurance coverage, Hispanic origin, home heating fuel, housing costs for owners, industry occupation and class of worker, marital status and history, ownership, home value and rent, place of birth and citizenship in the year of entry to the United States, plumbing, kitchen and telephone service, residence one year ago and migration. School enrollment, sex, vehicles available, veteran status, year built and year moved in. All right. Now remember that privacy loss sort of scales with the number of questions or inaccuracy has to scale. So you can see that that's an extremely challenging um, uh, problem is how to do differential privacy for the American Community Survey. Okay. Now, We've been talking so far uh, about releasing tables, and um, there's been also discussion of other modes of data access. So um, this is a picture of Steve Feinberg and uh, Joyce Feinberg. And Feinberg um, 
uh, as a giant statistician, and um, <clears throat> he was an expert on confidentiality protection, especially in the context of official statistics. And he taught me a lot about the kinds of concerns that people would have with new methodologies uh, like differential privacy and my awareness of sort of the difficulties of being able to interact with the data in differentially private fashion if you haven't been trained this way. Um, uh, uh, my awareness of this began with Steve talking to me about, about these kinds of things. And he's picked, as I said, this is Joyce Feinberg who was one of 11 people murdered. at the Tree of Life Synagogue Massacre in Pittsburgh. Now, one problem that uh, Jonathan Ullman and I began thinking about was inspired by Feinberg. We trust Feinberg. He was smart, he was well-intentioned, he knew what he was doing. And so the question is, could we give Steve access to raw data and let him look at it for a while, and then maybe when he decided what it is, what kinds of statistics would be interesting to publish, allow him to publish these things in a differentially private fashion. So we completely would trust him to follow the protocol and never say anything about the data other than what he does through this particular procedure. And the problem there is that uh, the choice of which statistic to publish could be disclosive. That is, Feinberg, looking at the data set, might choose a different statistic to publish if Bill Gates is in the data set than if Bill Gates is not in the data set. And that would violate differential privacy. Still, I think that this is a direction that we can pursue, and uh, John and I have some early ideas on this, which, which we published. Okay. Another thing is microdata. So the um, Census Bureau publishes not just a summaries and statistics, but they also publish what are called public use microdata, which are real data records that have been stripped of, of some identifying information. I would never say that they've been stripped of all of their personal identifying information, but they've been stripped of some things. And um, uh, many people, study these in order to, to try to understand the population. So could we, um, in a differentially private way, create this kind of microdata? So first of all, if we were really lucky and managed to do it in a differentially private way, there's still this issue of the fundamental law. The fundamental law has nothing to do with differential privacy and it just says, if these synthetic data allow you to determine overly accurate answers to too many questions, then they are inherently disclosive. And there's a second problem, which is that there are computational hardness issues associated with creating synthetic data in a differentially private way. Those issues don't arise if, as I said earlier, you publish just some sort of blob that allows people to compute from this blob the answers to their questions, um, the, the computational hardness results don't apply. But for synthetic data, they do come up. Okay. Um, nonetheless, uh, um, people are now looking at considering restricted class, so uh, releasing synthetic data that allows the uh, answers to restricted classes of queries, such as uh, low order marginals. and. Um, they're also looking at using GANs, of course, to, to try to generate synthetic data that have uh, some basic functionality. Okay, so I wanna end on an upbeat note. Um, this is a paper uh, in which Raj Chetty and John Friedman, building on techniques from differential privacy, suggest a method to reduce privacy loss for certain kinds of statistics, uh, such as ordinary least squares regression estimates, based on small samples. So differential privacy was really 
invented with internet scale data sets in mind, where adding a bit of noise just doesn't matter, uh, doesn't hurt your, 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 your very, very strong signal because the numbers are so large. But we want to be able to do things with small samples. Now, there's a technicality in their work that makes this not, strictly speaking, differentially private. Um, and we'll come back to that at the end. But it's very much, uh, as they say, uh, inspired by differential privacy. Okay. So this is a graph from their paper, which has, um, this, it's a plot of noise-infused data. So they're using this almost differentially private noise. And uh, even with the noise, they say, the data show a clear positive relationship between teenage birth rates and shares the share of single parent homes in the census tract. So what they're saying is that the neighborhood characteristics matter. And if in your census tract there are many single family homes, then there will be many uh, uh, black teenage mothers. Um, uh, so this is the teen birth rate for black women raised in low-income families. Okay? So the more single parent homes, the more this teen birth rate rises. Okay? Now, this is what the plot would have looked like if they had used some of the old techniques, and in particular, uh, cell suppression. So cell suppression is a technique in which if the incidence of something is small, typically below five, then that entire cell is suppressed. That entire tract, in this case, would be suppressed from the, from the, from the outcomes. They released uh, tracts where the count is zero because this is not thought to be disclosive. But if the number is between one and four, this was thought to be disclosive. So this is what it would look like. And notice that you really lose that strong slope that we had in the previous picture. So we're not getting the right picture anymore. And what's going on is that this cell suppression approach first of all, admit, omits or suppresses tracts with low but non-zero teenage birth rates. And these are tracts that have few single parents. So those data are simply being written out of the story and everything is being biased. The other uh, contribution to the, to the mistakes is that black women who grow up in tracts with smaller black populations have fewer teenage births but those tracts with smaller black populations uh, are more likely to be suppressed. So this kind of distortion is not telling you the real story. You can see that the story is, is completely obscured here. And it also contributes to the myth of hypersexualization among young African American women. So this is a case where having the differentially private noise really, or the almost differentially private noise, really was allowing the right story, the true story, to come through. And the old techniques were destroying it. And um, in very recent work, uh, Alabi, McMillan, Sarati, uh, Smith, and Vadan, in discussion with Chetty and Friedman, have been looking at really differentially private algorithms. And they've made a lot of progress on a truly differentially private solution. This is showing um, the y-axis is the 95th percentile of the error over 100 runs. The green curve is um, uh, the technique of Chetty and Friedman. The blue is one differentially private algorithm. And the orange are, is another differentially private algorithm. So we can see that with work, it's looking like it's becoming possible to get at least close to um, the results of Chetty and Friedman. Okay. And that's it. Thank you.
have questions at the front of the room. First question over here on the left. Hi, uh, uh, thanks for that amazing talk. It was very inspiring. I was wondering if differential privacy has any uh, light to shed on which data to collect in the first place. So you mentioned this issue of the citizenship question, and you also mentioned earlier in the talk that the types of data we collect might impact the privacy parameters we can expect from the data set. And so I'm wondering if there's any theory around that. No, and I think that there really should be theory around that. In some sense, the joy of differential privacy is you get to abstract all of that away and not think about what kind of data, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I, I, I do think it's a reasonable direction. It's, cons yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> I think it's a good direction. I don't know of work in it. Does anybody else know of work in it? No? OK. I have a bunch of experts in the front row, so I have some help. OK. OK. <clears throat> Thank you for an inspiring talk. Uh, the American Community Survey has been criticized for being very intrusive in, other, in that you have to provide a lot of personal data under penalty of law. It has been suggested that it be replaced by regular market research surveys which could be done in a less intrusive way. Does your research have anything to say with whether this would be effective or possible? No, I do not know. Maybe other people here do, but i am sort of been more s focused on the math, and I really don't know what's available through market research survey. Thank you for the talk, it was really enjoyable. Um, I have a question regarding kind of the spectrum of privacy protection. So you mentioned differential privacy is very robust. It works against any kind of attack and any kind of loss functions. I wonder if you've seen activities on the other end of spectrum designed for more specific inferential tasks and maybe possibly tasks that live for a shorter lifespan. For instance, maybe you want to protect privacy over a week and after which you know, data can be made public, then there's a better hope of deriving more efficient right. algorithms and love to hear right. you on that. So there is some work on um, this kind of thing where the protections kind of loosen up over time. Uh, there's a little bit of work on that. I haven't seen a lot. Um, one cautionary note there is that things that we may not understand now to be sensitive may turn out later to be sensitive. So an example of that might be uh, people who will say, oh, great, you can, you can publish my genome. And we don't know until much later that this portion actually says something about Alzheimer's or whatever. So I would be very worried about uh, having protections expire but I'm sure there are situations in which it makes perfect sense. Hello. Um, so maybe I misunderstood, but K is chosen for a particular survey, from a particular survey, is that right? I'm sorry, what's K? In, in the number of questions, so. Uh, that, okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so, is that right, that it's from the particular survey? So, what, what those things we're expressing is how, let's say if we're talking about counting queries, how many people in the database have this property or that property, K is just the number of counting queries that you are interested in being able to handle, and uh, the sensitivity will often be a function of K. Okay. How much one person's data can change. The sequence of outcomes will be a function of the length of the sequence of outcomes. So, I guess, I mean, what, what it seemed to me, and again, maybe I misunderstood, is, is that you're kind of assuming that the number of questions involved is, is finite. Right, that, that there's a, a clear bound on it. And isn't the real problem that, that the number of data sources is increasing significantly and that basically you can't 
cap the noise because of the largely increasing number of data sources? So this is a very interesting question and it has a bunch of different pieces. So let me try to disentangle a little bit. Um, one thing is that my data may be held in many different data sets. And when I said that differential privacy uh, composes uh, gracefully and automatically, we actually get differential privacy protections even when these different data sets are not communicating with each other. But nonetheless, that cumulative over all of the different databases queries uh, is something that hits us. So uh, there's a certain point in which sort of the world should have to stop. And, um, but the finiteness, of course, comes from the fundamental law of information recovery. Overly accurate answers to too many questions does destroy privacy, no matter what. That, that's what I thought was yes, the conclusion. Yes, that's just there. All right, thank you. Uh, so in some scenarios, you may have like a, a streaming pipeline where you have uh, data sets coming in and they're summarized in several stages. Um, yeah. And I assume that this work applies there. My question is about uh, auditing such pipelines. Um, so in commercial settings, maybe auditing is done uh, with respect to legal risk. There may not be a lot of legal risk depending on what the regulation on, regulations are in an area. Do you think there are potential policy questions here in the future about how do you, for example, mandate that privacy is preserved in these data pipelines? So I, I guess I don't feel equipped to answer the policy questions. I don't really know. I'm not a policy person or a political scientist or uh, uh, at all. Um, can you like ask the last, just, like summarize your question one more time because there was one other thing so, I wanted so to in say. So in some sense, uh, we have raw data coming in. It's processed right. through multiple right, right, stages. Right, right. Okay. Maybe mm -hmm. we don't trust all of those stages. How do we audit, audit them? Right. So um, I don't know how you would audit them. I, I would mention that the general problem of can you audit a series of responses in order to decide when you shouldn't issue an answer because in conjunction with everything that had been said before, this new piece of information would be disclosive, that doesn't work. Um, uh, uh, Dinor Kentapati and Nisim show that you can get yourself into a situation where if you say this is dangerous, then you've disclosed information. If you answer, it's dangerous. So um, I think you need to sort of build things the right way and then um, argue from there. I'm going to take one last question. This person's been waiting a while. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, this uh, definition of differential privacy is uh, just giving some uh, earlier thought to be, say, binary property of some something uh, that and makes it uh, on a scale. So there are many other interesting properties within social to choice theory. Are you aware that this principle of uh, basically con making a discrete property continuous has been applied in other things like, for instance, uh, manipulation or? Manipulation of? F for instance, um, manipulations in matching markets and uh, those kind of things. No, I don't know that literature. Okay. <laughs> then I'll have to switch myself, I guess. <laughs> okay, let's think. Talk to Nicole, <laughs> right there in the first row. Let's thank Cynthia for an excellent talk. I have one program announcement before everyone runs off. Um, the CRAE is having a networking reception at 5 p.m. today, and so for, particularly for all you students or other people who are looking for academic positions, so this is a good opportunity for you to meet people that have them. Okay, okay. thank you all. Thank you.